welcome to FISM News, I'm Renata Kish. And on tonight's program, Trump emerges victorious from the debate, while Democrats began discussing a possible replacement for Biden. And Oklahoma requires biblical instruction in public schools. Well, before we get into our debate coverage for today, I'd like to welcome my co-host for today, FISM's Ian Patrick. Welcome, Ian. Thank you so much, Renata. And uh, it was quite the honor to be on the uh, episode where we're talking about the first presidential debate. I have to say, I'm very <laughs> excited to go into our coverage here. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, on that note, let's jump right into the highlights. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump sparred over the border crisis, abortion, inflation, and more. Biden touted strong jo job numbers and called his predecessor a convicted felon, referring to Trump's hush money trial verdict. Trump started out by praising the economy under his administration while slamming the current economy under Biden. We have the greatest economy in the history of our country. Uh, we have never done so well. Every, everybody was amazed by it. Other countries were copying us. We got hit with COVID. And when we did, we spent the money necessary so we wouldn't end up in a Great Depression, the likes of which we had in 1929. Uh, the only jobs he created are for illegal immigrants and bounce back jobs, a bounce back from the COVID. He has not done a good job. He's done a poor job and inflation's killing our country. It is absolutely killing us. The former president emerged as a clear victor in the debate, while Biden's poor mental state could no longer be excused even by his supporters. Here's Biden trying to tie the overturning of Roe v. Wade to immigration. Look, there's so many young women who have been, including a young woman who just was murdered and he, he went to the funeral. Uh, the idea that she was murdered by, a, by, a, by an immigrant coming in, to, they talk about that. But here's the deal. There's a lot of young women who are being raped by their, by their in-laws, by their, by, by their spouses, brothers and sisters. By, oh, just, it's, it's just ridiculous. Trump responded by saying that Biden's border policies have been catastrophic while touting state control over abortion. As far as the abortion is concerned, it is now back with the states. The states are voting. Uh, in many cases, the, it's a, frankly a very liberal decision. In many cases, it's the opposite. Everybody wanted brought back. Ronald Reagan wanted it brought back. He wasn't able to get it. Everybody wanted it brought back. And many presidents had tried to get it back. I was the one to do it. And again, this gives it the vote of the people, and that's where they wanted it. Every legal scholar wanted it that way. According to CNN's flash poll, 67 percent of respondents thought Trump won the debate, while only 33 percent thought the same of Biden. But despite Trump walking away as the perceived victor, he was criticized for question dodging during the debate. Specifically, some analysts and voters pointed to one example on this issue. When Trump was asked about his actions on January 6th and what he had to say to voters about it, Trump responded to that question by saying that the nation has faltered under Biden. On January 6th, we had a great border, nobody coming through, very few. On January 6th, we were energy independent. On January 6th, we had the lowest taxes ever. We had the lowest regulations ever. On January 6th, we were respected all over the world. All over the world, we were respected. And then he comes in and we're now laughed at. We're like a bunch of stupid people. Now, Trump did clarify that on that day, he did ask the crowd to go peacefully to the Capitol. And then he also mentioned Nancy Pelosi's admission to having at least some responsibility in the chaos. I said peacefully and patriotically. And Nancy Pelosi, if you just watched the news from two days ago, on tape to her daughter, who's a documentary filmmaker, they say, but she's saying, oh, no, it's my responsibility. I was responsible for this because I offered her 10,000 soldiers or National Guard and she turned them down. President Biden then took the opportunity to lay into Trump as the main aggressor behind the entire riot. He encouraged those folks to go up on Capitol Hill, number one. I sat in the dining room off the Oval Office. He sat there for three hours, three hours watching, begging, being begged by his vice president and a number of his colleagues on the Republican side as well to do something, to call for a stop, to end it. Instead, he talked, they talked about these people being patriots and, and, and great patrons of America. 
But it was Biden's obvious mental decline that overshadowed the debate. The president started showing cognitive problems about 15 minutes into the event, and he didn't get much better from there. Here he is talking about his economic accomplishments, saying he beat Medicare. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. The president also boasted about creating 15,000 new jobs under his economy when he possibly meant to say 15 million jobs. Another moment showed the president seemingly losing his train of thought when he talked about the border. What's happened? I've changed it in a way that now you're in a situation where there are 40 percent fewer people coming across the border illegally. It's better than when he left office. And I'm going to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more Border Patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? I, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. And he showed his physical decline at the end of the debate when First Lady Jill Biden had to escort him off the stage. Making their way off the CNN debate stage. It's like uh, Jill Biden, the first lady, to, has come out, former President Trump, walking off the stage. The first debate of the 2024 campaign and the earliest presidential debate ever now in the books and in front of the voters. Tonight, along with Aaron Burnett, the first word on what those voters might make of it from our political professionals, from our CNN flash poll and swing state focus group. We'll be talking to surrogates, including Vice President Harris, getting fact checks from our Daniel. And Biden's performance is arguably the biggest news to come out of this debate, as many Democrat strategists reportedly began panicking shortly after the debate concluded. Republican Senator J.D. Vance from Ohio even indicated that the Democrats might be looking to outright replace Biden. You hear Democratic operatives now, and we have, we have the spin room behind us. They're talking about how they don't want Joe Biden on the ticket anymore. Well, what is a bigger threat to democracy than running this entire primary process yeah. and then effectively throwing a guy off because he had a disastrous debate performance? This is the choice that Democrats have offered the American people. I'm proud that Republicans offered a different choice, and I think they're going to make the right one. Now, MSNBC's Joy Reid actually spoke about how she was in conversation with many Democrats during the debate all of whom were in a panic about their candidate for president. My phone really never stopped uh, buzzing throughout. And the um, universal reaction was somewhere approaching panic. Joe Biden's job was to reassure them tonight. His job was to calm his party, to make them feel that, yes, I can do this. I have four more years in me. I have the ability uh, and the stamina and the strength to do four more years. He did not do that. He did the opposite of that. And frankly, all of these comments and speculations seem to be ringing true, at least to some extent. According to CNN's chief national correspondent, John King, the conversation to possibly replace Biden even began minutes into the debate. Right now, as we speak, there is a deep, a wide and a very aggressive panic in the Democratic Party. It started minutes into the debate and it continues right now. It involves party strategists, it involves elected officials, it involves fundraisers. And they're having conversations about the president's performance, which they think was dismal, which they think will hurt other people down the party in the ticket. And they're having conversations about what they should do about it. Some of those conversations include, should we go to the White House and ask the president to step aside? Others are, other of the conversations are about, should prominent Democrats go public with that call? Even so, some are still trying to prop up the president despite his performance, including in that uh, list of people is Vice President Kamala Harris, who said that the beginning was certainly slow, but she still defended his performance throughout. And First Lady Jill Biden also congratulated the president after the debate for, quote, answering the questions. That statement in particular was criticized for how low it set the bar for Biden. And lastly, Border Patrol quickly fact-checked Biden when he claimed they endorsed him. President Biden defended his border policies that led to a massive influx of illegal immigrants, saying Border Patrol endorsed his position on the issue. Shortly after his comment, the Border Patrol Union posted on X, quote, To be clear, we have never and, ne and will never endorse Biden. The account added on the morning of the debate that the Biden administration blamed Republicans for blocking Biden's attempt to hire thousands 
dozens of Border Patrol agents. They said in reality, Republicans have actually funded more agents in recent appropriations bills in spite of Biden, not because of him. And that wraps up our coverage on the debate. And stay tuned for more politics when we come back from this break. Are you new to biblically responsible investing? As Christians, we have the responsibility to be good stewards of the money God has entrusted us with. As we invest in the market, we want to make sure that the companies we invest in aren't taking money and using it to fund industries that grieve the heart of God, like pornography, abortion, gambling, or the LGBT agenda. That doesn't mean a company must be a Christian company to be biblically responsible. It means that company is solely focused on excellence in its industry and doesn't support things that God hates. To learn more about biblically responsible investing and how you can put it to practice in your portfolio, go to financialissues.org. The mission of Financial Issues is to expose Jesus for all He is, all He means, and all that He can do. On the day I found I was pregnant, I was full of emotions and I just was so overwhelmed and I don't know if I'm ready for this huge life altering, changing commitment. I had individuals around me not wanting me to have this child. And somehow, and I was driving and I saw the Women's Help Center sign and I immediately turned in. That just took relief off of me. And I was like, you know what? It's gonna be okay. They gave me the confidence and the support that I needed to be able to go out and face the world. First time I held Finnegan, I just lit up with joy. I was so excited. This little boy that I had in my life, he is loving and generous. Watching him just grow and flourish into this incredible human being has just been so rewarding and so uplifting. Looking back, I don't know what I would do without him because I needed him more than I think he needed me. And welcome back to FISM News. I'm Ian Patrick. Let's continue our political coverage now, starting in the House of Representatives, which has unveiled new information on the Hunter Biden laptop cover-up attempt. The House Judiciary Committee released transcripts of interviews with eight intelligence officials involved in the now infamous letter claiming the laptop could have been a Russian information operation. Of note from these transcripts were interviews from former CIA directors John Brennan and Michael Morrill. Morrill, who helped draft the letter, told the committee that his purpose in doing so was to warn Americans of a possible Russian operation and to aid Biden in his campaign for president. When asked why he wanted to help Biden, Morrill replied, because I wanted him to win the election. Brennan, meanwhile, said that other members who co-signed the letter might have also done so in support of Biden, similar to Morrill, but Brennan's reasoning was to, quote, bring attention to the potential for Russian interference. Meanwhile, a new report from the Manhattan Institute found that within the next 10 years, the U.S. will likely reach a federal budget deficit of roughly $3 trillion. The report estimated that servicing the interest on current debt would take up to nearly 75 percent of all tax revenue. Budget expert and the report's author, Brian Riedel, wrote, quote, In short, Washington is in a totally unsustainable fiscal path and a debt crisis is coming. Riedel blamed, uh, blamed spending on Social Security and Medicare for the ballooning debt. The report estimated that Social Security and Medicare face a combined $124 trillion cash deficit over the next 30 years. Riedel warned lawmakers that unless something uh, spending cuts are implemented soon, the government will likely need to implement large tax hikes to keep itself funded. Riedel estimated that interest payments could consume up to three quarters of U.S. US tax revenue in the future. He further questioned the government's ability to keep itself solvent, warning that a failure to pay its debts could lead to an economic disaster. And let's now turn to the judicial branch, where the Supreme Court has been busy issuing multiple rulings as of late. In fact, today, the highest court in the land ruled on a case involving the January 6 rioters. The Supreme Court ruled 6-3 to three that the Justice Department had overstepped its boundaries when it charged hundreds of people at the riot with obstruction. 
The court also ruled that the charge could still be filed against these rioters if prosecutors could actually demonstrate that they were aiming to prevent the certification of the 2020 election. Still, this ruling means that the near 250 pending cases involving obstruction on January 6th could very well be impacted. In addition, the ruling could also impact obstruction charges against former President Trump, as his team will likely use this Supreme Court opinion to challenge the validity of those obstruction charges. Meanwhile, Trump still has another case before the Supreme Court, specifically on his claim to presidential immunity. And still on the topic of the Supreme Court, yesterday the High Court blocked a bankruptcy settlement with Purdue Pharma that would have shielded its owners from lawsuits over their role in the nation's deadly opioid epidemic. The Sackler family, who owned Purdue, had agreed to pay up to $6 billion to settle thousands of lawsuits, accusing the company of misleading doctors and patients about the potential harms of OxyContin. Elsewhere, the Supreme Court paused Environmental Protection Agency rule that would have cracked down on power plant pollution. The justices agreed 5-4 to four to pause the ruling that would place restrictions on power plants and other industry sources in 23 states. This comes as the High Court is also set to rule in the Chevron deference. The decades-old law gives administrative agencies broad discretion to create regulations. If overturned, it could blow a hole into the Biden administration's climate initiatives. And let's move now to some international coverage, starting in Israel, where forces there actually bombed Hezbollah targets in Lebanon on Thursday night. IDF officials announced on Friday that they had struck Hezbollah military structures overnight in, the, in southern Lebanon specifically. The strike reportedly came after anti-tank missiles were launched across the border by Hezbollah fighters. Israeli officials did not report any casualties as a result of these missiles, and parts of northern Israel were also kept under alert most of Thursday as Hezbollah rockets continued to target IDF installations. This escalation in fighting also comes as the United States moves its troops closer to the region, with U.S. officials even warning of the possibility of a civilian evacuation, as a full-scale war between both Israel and Lebanon just seems more likely as time goes by. And still in Israel, anti-government protesters gathered outside the home of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last night. Carrying signs and lighting fires, the protesters called on Netanyahu to resign his post as the country's top leader. Other protesters called on the government to hold new elections. Police formed a barricade outside of Netanyahu's residence, but did not use water cannons to disperse the crowd, as they had done before. The protest was just the latest in the past several weeks that called on Netanyahu to resign. Tens of thousands of uh, opposition protesters gathered throughout Jerusalem to voice their op opposition to Netanyahu and the ongoing conflicts against Hamas and Hezbollah. Protesters have criticized Netanyahu for his handling of the invasion of Gaza and increased tensions with Lebanon. Analysts have noted that the protests are unlikely to change Netanyahu's position as he currently holds a firm majority in Israel's legislature. All right, and we have more coverage coming up next. But first, let's go to FISM Sesidinsky for a moment in history. Welcome back to A Moment in History. I'm Seth Udinsky. Have you ever wondered what it would have been like to be a friend of the apostles in the early days of the church? I know I certainly have. And you know, history reveals to us several men at the turn of the first century AD into the second who learned and were discipled by the aging apostles at a very young age. One of these young men would go on just like the apostles under which he learned to give his life for the sake of the gospel when he too was an old man. His name was Polycarp, and he lived in present-day Turkey in the late 1st and early 2nd centuries AD. As with many Christian martyrs in the early centuries of the church, Polycarp's legacy is surrounded by legends and tradition, but, you know, as historians, we need to remember that tradition can sometimes be as reliable as a primary document since it has stood the test of time. And I believe the same can be said for Polycarp. So evidence suggests that Polycarp, born sometime in the 60s uh, AD, was likely saved as a very young man and was discipled by the aging John the Apostle. Tradition tells us that Polycarp may have been the last surviving believer to have known one of the 12 apostles in life. 
So Polycarp became the pastor of the church in Smyrna in modern day Turkey, probably at the request of John the Beloved himself, who as the very likely last surviving apostle of Jesus at the turn of the first century would have held incredible weight uh, with his pastoral recommendation. So Polycarp was a faithful minister of the gospel throughout his whole life in the second century AD. Now we have to remember, Rome is at the height of its power at this time and Christianity represents a threat to the Roman state because the Roman political state was intimately intertwined with the Roman cult of the Pantheon. So to deny the lordship of Caesar and the gods and instead confess the lordship of Jesus Christ was a crime against the state and it was punishable usually by death. This did not seem to bother or deter Polycarp one bit. In fact, by the year 155 AD or so, Polycarp was an old man, likely in his 80s, and he was taken into custody under the Romans for refusing to deny his faithfulness to Christ. Some legends tell of a story where an aged Polycarp, knowing he was about to be arrested, did not flee his pursuers, but instead invited the soldiers into his home to enjoy a meal before they would arrest him. Polycarp was condemned to burn for his faith. Now, there are other legends that tell of a divine miracle that happened upon his execution, where flames failed to harm the aged believer as he was tied to the stake. So in rage, the Roman soldiers then ran him through with the sword to kill him. At his execution, he allegedly uttered these famous words, Eighty and six years have I served my Lord, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my King and my Savior? Thanks so much for joining me once again for a moment in history. There are moments in life that define us. Choices determine the courses we take. Choices that create life. Or those that save a life. And some make life worthwhile. There are decisions to stay or to go. To remain the same or to grow. Sometimes we pray and make peace. Other times we take a stand for what we believe. In celebration, mourning, triumph, and defeat, we are invested in every decision we seek. Despite differences, we have one thing in common, the desire to do all for the glory of God. Keep your wallet aligned with your heart and your investments in harmony with your faith. Timothy Plan, biblically responsible mutual funds, ETFs, and retirement plans. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. Hi, this is Sheena Burt, the host of Financial Issues. The Financial Issues family is so blessed to have saved tens of thousands of babies, all thanks to the generous support of you, our listeners and viewers. For $140, you can sponsor five ultrasounds. Please go to preborn.org, that's preborn.org, or financialissues.org and click on the preborn logo. Save a baby, save a life. And welcome back once again to FISM News. Let's resume our coverage now with some national news, starting with the latest from Uvalde, Texas, where former police chief Pete Arredondo was charged with child endangerment. Arredondo was in charge of the police response to the 2022 shooting at Robb Elementary School. Arredondo was heavily criticized for a delayed police response, waiting over an hour to confront the shooter, who ended up killing 19 students and two teachers. On Thursday of this week, Arredondo was arrested and booked into the Uvalde County Jail on 10 counts of child endangerment. He and another responding officer were previously indicted by a grand jury. That indictment alleges that Arredondo failed to respond to the shooting in an appropriate manner. This also comes over a month after victims' family members reached a $2 million settlement with the city of Uvalde. Meanwhile, a new report from the Daily Wire found that the Department of the Interior has been pushing employees to alter their speech to make it politically correct. An internal guide obtained by the conservative news outlet encourages employees to use so-called inclusive language. A list of 104 words and terms was included in the guide, as well as suggested alternatives. The department encouraged employees not to use words like husband, wife, son, and daughter. Additionally, the guide encouraged the employees to use they, them pronouns for people rather than assuming their gender. 
Employees were told to avoid phrases such as he or she, claiming that it promoted an exclusively binary nature of gender and excludes individuals who do not use these pronouns. The guide further explained that staff should refrain from the term preferred pronouns because it implies a choice about one's gender. The document also called on employees to no longer use gender honorifics such as Miss or Mr. I gotta say, that's probably the most extensive one of those policies I've seen, at least in the government to date. Uh, at the same time, there is one company, however, that is backing away from similar kinds of policies after receiving extreme consumer backlash. That company is Tractor Supply. The retail chain had previously said it would try to achieve net zero emissions by 2040 and increase people of color at the manager level and above by 50%, this by the year of 2026, and they would do this through DEI initiatives. But this week, the company said it was going to remove all of these goals, citing weeks of consumer backlash. The company issued a statement in which it said that it recognized it had disappointed its customers and had taken this feedback to heart. For example, it will retire its current DEI goals and eliminate any roles for DEI policies. The company also said it will retire its carbon emission goals. And instead, Tractor Supply said it will focus on rural American priorities, which includes everything from animal warfare to veteran causes and even some conservation efforts. Meanwhile, Oklahoma public schools are now requiring Bible teachings as part of their curriculum. Oklahoma Superintendent of Public Instruction Ryan Walters issued a memo yesterday saying that school districts across the state are now required to incorporate the Bible and the Ten Commandments into lessons for grades 5 through 12 for historical context. Walters told the Washington Examiner that there is a critical need to study the Bible and the Ten Commandments in Oklahoma's classrooms. He added, quote, this is not merely an educational directive, but a crucial step in ensuring our students grasp the core values and historical context of our country. The new curriculum will go into effect in the fall. It's very cool to see Oklahoma joining the ranks of other states when it comes to learning about the Ten Commandments in public schools. And to end our program today, while we're on the topic of Christianity specifically, let's look to Saturday, which marks the sixth annual Day of the Christian Martyr, an event meant to remember those who have lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. Uh, this Day of Remembrance was launched in 2019 by the Christian organization Voice of the Martyrs, and it's actually meant to coincide with the anniversary of the beheading of St. Paul in Rome. The organization has shared the stories of martyrs such as John Chow, who was killed trying to spread the gospel on North Sentinel Island in India, and Rocio Pino, who was murdered by Marxist guerrillas in Colombia. The organization further encouraged people to reflect on the recent and ongoing Christian persecutions in places such as China, Nigeria, and Iraq. And as always, we ask that you would please pray for protection and courage for those who are still on the front lines in those countries experiencing such persecution. Absolutely, and, those, and that's definitely encouraging to hear that there are still so many Christians standing up for Christ. All right, well, that's our program for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and please visit FISMnews.tv for more content. For any updates until our next show, follow us on social media at FISM News or download the FISM app on your smartphone. Thank you so much, God bless, and we'll see you next week.